Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's performance will include ancient frescoes, ugly miracles, and bizarre commitment to running jokes. All this as we explore Pompeii here on Created Things. And welcome to Created Things, the podcast whose passion, whose love, whose verve comes rushing at you like a 30 trillion tonning pour of ash that will bury and destroy you. I am your host, <laughs> Father Gabriel Toretta, Dominican priest, um, aspiring medievalist, um, which is something you really only say when you're talking to people at Ren Fairs. But anyway, also with me is somebody else who is also a host of the show. Um, he's I would like to introduce him to you. His name is Jacob. He has a last name too. It's Hi. Horace Popcheck. Hello. He is an hello, artist. Hello. He is a psychotherapist. Um, his love is a burning volcano. How are you? Uh, I am burning in volcanic. What's the difference between being an aspiring medievalist and then your normal moniker being a burgeoning medievalist? Or are you just changing it up? Well, you know, sometimes you burgeon. Sometimes you just aspire to burgeon. Okay, so aspiring is one below, sort of standard deviation below burgeoning. I think it probably is, because I think burgeoning is something that's actually already happening. Aspiring is like, well... That would be nice. I'd like to do that. I would like. Yeah. I would like to do that. Once I'm down to burgeon. Yeah. Once. Once I. Uh, once I'm able to finish. You know, hand stitching all of the sequins onto my jester's costume, then I can. You know, <laughs> uh, so I can begin to burgeon in my Ren fair life. Um, so you know, maybe that's maybe that's what I'm looking for right now. I am genuinely sad that, and we should save a lot of these comments for an actual like Renaissance Festival episode or a series of Renaissance Festival episodes, which I would really like to do. But um, I am sad that that your move to Austria prevented us from attending a Renaissance Festival together um, here in the States because on two levels, one, you know, sort of in a personal way, I would love to just experience it with you and, and, you know, comparing our, our experience of like theatrical weirdness and nerdiness with what we actually know the middle ages to be like would be hilarious. And we could get very, very inebriated. Uh, but, but on a macro level, I'm always annoyed with the church, uh, that she doesn't just rent out a stall at renaissance festivals mm. to like do confessions i feel like it would be an excellent evangelization tool to just have a priest you know because there's always somebody pretending to be like a fake bishop or something at renaissance festivals who just shows up and like you know uh excommunicates people or whatever else and it's like if you actually just paid to rent a stall at a renaissance festival set up did confessions and had little pamphlets like hey uh, we are still around as a group did, of people. Did and you know? We've been, did you we've know? We've been praying yeah. for you since this time was a real time and not just something we were play acting at. I don't know. I think a lot of people would be like, wait, are you like a real priest? I think it could be a great experience. And and I, I would have uh, loved to somehow hornswoggle you into doing something like that. Yeah. Well, I am ready to be boondoggled and hornswoggled um, and occasionally um shanghai but um sadly uh first i was i was schlepped off to vienna and there it is so um although mm -hmm. i did in fact the, the closest thing to a renaissance festival i've ever attended in my entire life um was the summer i spent in munich um it's a long story but the short version is that um i got invited to um I'm just going to say it. I got invited to a princess's castle. Uh, what? Where the princess on the grounds of her castle was holding um, Germany's biggest Renaissance festival, which is not actually a Renaissance festival. It's actually a medieval festival. Uh, and they call it a, a knight's tournament. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's on the grounds of an actual castle um, that is still operating and still owned and lived in by the family that's always owned it and lived in it. Um, and they run a brewery there as well called König Ludwig, um, which you may have actually heard of. It's a really, it's, it's important in the States. It's a very nice um, Weissbier mostly. And um, 
Uh, yeah, it was in, it was an incredible night. Like heaven, that sounds incredible. Uh, it one was, night with the princess at a Renaissance festival of the brewery. Yeah, it was Holy one crap. of the wildest and most amazing things that ever happened to me in my life. Yeah, because like because we sat with, I mean, we sat with the princess. Um, yeah, watching of you did. watching the the uh, night tournament show, um, which was amazing. This sounds this sounds like a Hallmark movie. Um, yeah. Yeah, a home. You yeah, meet the, that you seems meet a real princess at the Renaissance Festival, and she's got you know twenty four hours to find a husband, but didn't count on falling in love. Didn't count on falling in it, love. Well, she is like in her later middle ages, and uh, she's herself like the Renaissance Festival in her later middle ages, and uh, <laughs> um, is say. married, you know, and has children um, who were grown up. So uh, sure. she was really not looking for love, and yet. And yeah, <laughs> that's how all the best that's all the best Hallmark movies start. So, um, yeah, no, it's incredible. Uh, so, so these speaking things do happen. of your <clears throat> speaking of your exotic travels, um, yeah. So and speaking fact, of things that happen to life, yeah, yes, yeah, because you have many exotic travels and incredible adventures, and and our episode today is on one such recent adventure only we're going back a lot further than the uh, than the renaissance or the middle ages as blurred as that line can be when it comes to fests um indeed you uh we we a couple months ago for context we did a an episode after you took a retreat to toledo in spain um we did kind of just a conversation on that and it was in part because we were tired and too lazy to come up with a topic um but it Solid. was a really good opportunity to talk about um the art of a very specific space and um why you know it ended up being a really interesting conversation in my mind anyway about you know why um certain art that's normally overlooked is actually really quite significant and it gives you kind of a window um, into those people uh, and, and how they appreciated art and beauty and things like this. So I was really excited when you took your most recent trip to kind of revisit those same themes in a new way. Uh, why don't you tell us, give us a little postcard. Where, where were you recently? Do, do, do. Um, yeah. So I, it's a it's a wild story, but shortly after I arrived in Vienna, um, I went and spent a week in southern Italy, which is, um, for the record, not exactly close to Vienna. Um, this, well, closer closer to Vienna than we are. Uh, true, than I am anyway. true. Then the, yes, yes, indeed. Um, yes, indeed. <clears throat> um, and uh, and it's 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 a complicated story, but um, in any case, uh, it meant that uh, I was able to go to. Pompeii, which I'd always wanted to go to, um, and uh, but I'd never had the chance to, and um, and so I was able to go and spend the whole day in Pompeii. It was great. I I like got there early in the morning, and I left when the park when you know park when the I left when they kicked us out, which was great, which is in the evening. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I also thought that it would be like a worthwhile to kind of think and talk about what that is. Um, because, okay. I mean, so everyone knows like the, what Pompeii is, you know, but um, I don't know. I just, it was an interesting experience there. And I think it, it um, not, not exactly a travelogue, but just um, using it as a base for, of, of experience from which to think about um, a very particular places, uh, life in art it seemed very fruitful, you know, so um, just really quickly the snapshot um, since, okay, everyone knows that Pompeii is like a buried city, but just really quickly the snapshot is that um, uh, probably August 24th, 79, 80, um, the beginning of the reign of um, Emperor uh, it's Vespasian's son, what's his name? Claudius, um, no, gosh dang it. Ooh, what's anyway. his name? Vespasian's boy. Oh, Vespasian's boy. It was embarrassing. I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, he only, he only ruled from 79 to 81 anyway, so who cares? Um, but, uh, so, uh, there's a normal-sized, mid-sized, uh, pretty prosperous, uh, Roman city on the southern southern with a slight edge to the east uh, side of uh, this big volcano, um, Vesuvius. Um, there had been earthquakes and things like there was a giant, there was a giant earthquake that um, 
destroyed a bunch of the city in the 60s and um and the town was sort of rebuilding from that there's all these like, inscriptions and things of like politicians who like um put their names all over something because they rebuilt it after the big earthquake um now geologically seismically speaking if you're around like a big volcano say and there's like a bunch of like really bizarrely big earthquakes that are happening you should it's maybe a bad sign probably yeah you should probably sell your house or at least airbnb it and like try <laughs> not to take any reservations for a while um but in any case don't live there anymore um because uh yeah so then on a on august 24th 79 um i it blew up and it's really wild because we have these really direct descriptions of it blowing up because um there are these two uh one was kind of a natural historian natural philosopher um and one was sort of a, a historian uh conveniently they're named Pliny the elder and Pliny the younger um no relation just kidding one was the dad of the other <laughs> uh and so like so you've got you've got like the bay of naples uh and like vesuvius is on the southern end of it and the city of what's now naples is like at the northern end of it and um these guys these um so plenty of the elder was you know an older man at the time and uh there are these like natural historians natural scientists they're super interested in these things and um plenty of the elder when he sees the mountain blowing up across the bay he's like i am gonna get on a boat and like go look at this just a like a i'm going to observe what's happening because he's a natural historian you know so he would observe things closely and write down what he saw uh i'm going to go mm. observe this from the water um like do you want to come along son plenty plenty comma the younger uh i believe the younger was literally like dad i have to do homework i'm not gonna come <laughs> and he's like whatever my son sucks and he went out into the bay and of course he died because like burning hot ash poured down on him because nobody expected that it was going to be um quite as catastrophic as it was and so he died uh in that um and uh and plenty of the younger wrote all about it like seeing the whole thing happen and like you know seeing the sun vanish in the middle of the morning and like watching his dad get buried by ash uh in the middle of the bay and like all this kind of stuff so anyway we have this all this really fascinating um uh like literal eyewitness account um from one of the great from from a great like literary mind you know so who's who can put it in really wonderful detail um we don't have any accounts from pompeii because it vanishes within like hours um because right. you know the whole because it's a, it's a really big mountain and the whole thing basically blows up and then um the whole thing just gets buried within um, a couple of hours um in ash and lava and rocks and stuff and so um so it's a you know it's a terrible tragedy like literally everybody in the literally everybody in the area dies um like almost instantaneously um and uh and one of the consequences of this is that um, the city is, because it all happens so quickly, um, and they built with stone, um, that was a really important element of this, the whole thing that like almost all the buildings were stone, except for the roofs, which were a flammable material. Um, they built in stone, and uh, they uh, the, the thing happened so quickly um that uh everything just was as it was just buried under you know like five feet of ash and lava and stuff um and it stayed that way until 1748 when um like a early sort of geological engineer um like accidentally found it so we found out that there's just an entire city buried there under the rock um which is sort of a surprising thing to discover this isn't like oh i found a building under the ground this is like oh i found an entire city in which literally everything is preserved so remarkably in situ like in place in mode that like if you're good about the way that you dig things out like 
here's a man who died holding a coffee cup equivalent, you know, like, and then like, here's right. everything in the house, just exactly the way that it was. Here are all of these walls covered in frescoes where like the frescoes, because like, what's going to destroy a fresco? It, it, it just, it's a weird concept to think about, but like, in fact, what's going to destroy something like a fresco uh, is not um, a pouring stream of like whatever, 2000 degree lava uh in a moment bizarrely that's not going to destroy your fresco um or your pots or your sculptures or all of your amazing things um or your frying pans or whatever uh what's going to destroy them is exposure to the air and exposure to the air for 1950 years would have eliminated basically all of these things um but uh because they were buried they still exist um and crazy which is insane um yeah but there are things like just sort of literally frozen in time yeah yeah there's 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 a there is a somewhat similar situation in uh, a place that's known um now as dura yarapos in um eastern syria and there in 256 um it's not that there was a um a volcano but the the um uh the persian sassanids were invading from they were on the west and they were pushing to the east um which was it was a roman town um in syria you know and uh they were they had been besieging it for a long time and then like and then they were like pressing hard trying to get through the the wall on the western side of the city um and the romans did what the romans do which is that when they when the a wall is um going to be breached uh they buried they buried um one big section of the city like the whole western section of the city they just buried turned to turn the entire western section of the city into um uh into a wall um but they buried it like literally over the course of like a couple of weeks um just threw a bunch of dirt on it um and then like it didn't work anyway long long story short the the sasanas still came in and like killed everybody in the city um and then it was abandoned and nobody ever used the city again. And so the whole city then got like over the course of not very long covered just by literally the sons of time. Uh, <laughs> yes, I too have seen Aladdin. And um, uh, and that was also only discovered in like um, after World War One. Um, wow. And like that's where the world's oldest uh, church is found um so the world the world's oldest church paintings um are from dura europas because it just so happens that one of the buildings uh net right next to the western wall that was buried intentionally buried um to protect the wall uh was a christian church from like crazy yeah from like 230 230 ad so it's oh, the, wow. it's the absolutely weird. oldest thing we have it's absolutely insane anyway so these things happen that's just a way of saying that like um i some like these cataclysmic destruction ca- certain kinds of cataclysmic destru- destruction um can actually preserve art in a way and i'm not putting in, i'm not yeah, in a, in a really prioritizing cool that over human life i'm just saying like there it is that's what happened so i want to talk about the art that you saw because as i said in the kind of queue up for this that i mean that's why we're here that's what the podcast is for and that's what i'm interested in but all i mean on the human life part of it i'm curious as to why you went Um, because we've talked a little bit about here on the podcast, my own personal discomfort. I think we talked about a little bit in relics and stuff like this, but my own sort of discomfort with the ghoulishness of, um, like body tourism, essentially. Oh yeah. Gross. Um, Mm -hmm. right. Like we had talked about, you know, putting, um, dead people like on display in various forms in museums and my discomfort with that. And like, I certainly think that this is a different thing than that. Um, there's there's something that could be um very you know moving or spiritual even about you know visiting a site like this but but places like this places like like even auschwitz you know where where it's like oh yeah we're gonna go for a day and go check out this place where these terrible things happened um i don't know that that's a hard sell for me not because i'm like oh i don't want my vacation to get bummed out but because I don't think I personally know the disposition that I would need to go there in, uh, in order to then 
like not be ashamed afterwards. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you know? sure, not, sure, sure, like, yeah. Feel like I'd done something really like inappropriate by visiting this the same way I would just a random old building or a museum or something like this. So I'm curious, like to talk about that disposition, but also what compelled you during the very limited time you had in Italy to say, no, no, this is, this is the thing that I, I want to take my time to go look at and, and, and be a part of. Yeah. Um, I think a big part of it for me is just that, um, with my studies, even though, um, CF super aspiring medievalist, um, I have spent a lot of time, um, with, uh, with the, early Christian period um, and then the the Roman cultural period that's called um, the second sophistic, um, which is like the mid first century to the early third century, um, which is just a super, super, super duper fascinating period in human history and culture. Um, and one that is absolutely dramatically critical for uh, understanding a lot of things about um, the way that Christianity takes the particular historical shape that it does, because it's um, this is basically the um, it's in this cultural and religious milieu uh, that God chooses to be the fullness of time in which he sends his son and like the church takes its shape. You know, so that there's something really weird and particular and uh, wild about that, that like uh, the more that I've learned about that culture and just what it is and what it was like and what it was like to live in it. Um, you know, I've just I've just, you know, read a lot of scholarly works analyzing it. And then I've read a lot of early Christian works um, that are speaking from the perspective of people who are living in it and books about Jews who are living in this in this time period and, um, you know, pagans you know, non-Christians, non-Jews, whatever you want to call them. Um, and it's, it's just, it's just a really, really, really interesting cultural moment. Um, I think for its own sake. And then as a Christian, uh, with a really profound love for historical particularity and historical reality, um, being able to see this period more freely and then with my own eyes, I think it gives me a deeper freedom to be able to understand and appreciate, um, why the religion that sets me free has some of the shape that it has, um, which just gives me a deeper freedom of mind and heart, which I think is really beautiful. Um, and then I have a great deal of interest in this kind of art and architecture and um, cultural life, you know, like there aren't that many places that you can go to where you can be kind of immersed you know, in, uh, in an environment, uh, in a not totally curated way. I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to overly, I don't want to overplay these things. I mean, like there are sections where like it don't take this the wrong way, but like there are, there, there are sections where the ruins are literally under construction. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know uh yeah the yeah, ruins just are literally that, under construction just that phrase is, is yeah. a funny phrase but i know what you mean where they're trying to preserve it and make sure it doesn't fall apart now that it is exposed to air and yeah and they're and they're continuing to expose tons of stuff so um only something like two-thirds of the city maybe has been um brought to the brought to light um and maybe less than that i forget exactly um, oh wow i actually didn't realize that that's pretty amazing yeah significant portions remain pretty much entirely unexplored and w- the major stuff that was ex- exposed um is especially the wealthy neighborhoods basically there was a high priority for and totally understandably on like i mean you, you don't want to see like a a hovel like a, a a warren of hovels where poor people lived, where there's no artifacts or decorations or anything because they were too poor to have artifacts or decorations or anything. Um, you want to see like the big, beautiful villa with like where literally every surface, every like vertical surface has a fresco on it and every horizontal surface ha- surface has a mosaic on it. And like, or, you know, the, the ground is like everything's covered in mosaic and then like the ceiling is all covered in molding and is splendidly splendid um it was, you know it, um images and stuff like that's what you want to see and so there's a really high there was a really high, high priority on um i uh, exposing to the air like those kinds of things um 
but uh, but yeah, so it's so it's not um, the whole city is not exposed. Um, although as I've done so, you can spend absolutely all day um, walking. It's it's still a big enough city that you can literally spend all day walking um, walking around it, which I did. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. So I confess, like thinking about it from the human perspective, about like, uh, well, this is a place that we can walk around in now in this wildly immersive and immediate way because everybody in it died in you know within an hour's time span um or so um you know you think about it you pray for them um this is there i mean there's fascinating moments where you you walk through the cemetery of or like for instance a cemetery of pompeii and you, you look at all these big mausolea and um these you know funeral monuments and things and you realize oh these are all the people who like died before the deluge you know, oh, it's like crazy. they were, yeah. Of course, they were already they were already dead, right? Before right. everybody else died. Um, so anyway, it's just like you see the some of these interesting things like this. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's good, it's interesting. I mean, you you there's a there's a certain openness of the of the heart to just like remember that all these people died here and to, and to pray for them and to think think about them. Um, at the same time, it's no specific work of human evil um, that sure, that must yeah. be that must be kept in the forefront of one's conscience and consciousness. Um, and uh, there's something that's particular about this place because, in fact, like I mean, even in America, where our history is only only goes a couple hundred years back, like still every place that we walk um, has that many dead people <laughs> who were there, you know. 200 years ago and aren't anymore i mean you know it's just like i don't want to make light yeah, of it but yeah. um you know uh but death is a part of life yeah. yeah the dead walk with us and we walk with them and like there it is you know um i mean yeah i mean they're dead don't get me wrong um i have very i have very very traditional beliefs about what happens with the dead when they die but like um but regardless <laughs> you know um <laughs> So, I uh, so yeah, no, so I mean, and, it's a it's a that's a fairly and I think healthy uh, pragmatic view. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And like, yeah. So you know, there there it is. You know, and it's and they they I have to say they are not morbid about it. So they they're they don't sort of like morbidly stage because um, they they uh, at one point somebody figured out this is relatively long ago maybe the late 19th century i forget somebody figured out that when they when he was sort of like digging you know exposing stuff um that if you found what was clearly a body then you could like basically pour concrete or something into the cavity that's produced um and have the exact exact shape of the body in the way that it was found and it's really dramatic because because the, they have a few of these preserved and they're kept in a particular place and uh, and you see i mean it's just people were overcome in a second um and so their postures are like that you know um there's a whole family mm -hmm. of people who was running away and then they're overcome in a second that's just that you know so that's that pulls at the heart and you know you you bring that to the lord and you pray for them and stuff um but overall in pompeii they're not morbid about it they don't like stage them places they're not trying to be weird about it they're not like staging fake bodies like eating dinner or something like this which, which would be really gross and i wouldn't want any part of it um there's just there's just a couple places in the music in the in a kind of museum-y part where um they have some of these early casts of bodies um and that's it so the rest you just walk okay. around at empty streets you know crazy okay no that makes me feel a lot better um i i I'm certainly would love the opportunity to check it out myself but uh but yeah no that those things always weird me out a little bit so i i appreciate your your kind of explanation of of why you were able to be comfortable with it so you're walking though i mean to the art thing you're you're walking around this city that you can literally which i i mean stupidly i didn't really realize it was big enough to be able to spend that much time there and still have so much left over it makes sense of course because it's a city but you just it doesn't occur to you you know when you visit historical sites it's like okay that was a nice afternoon and then you know exactly leave, right yeah, so that's that's a little trippy but what what was the what started to strike you most about the art that you were experiencing there. I mean, you're talking about these frescoes that have been have that have withstood, you know, the test of time, which is a crazy thing on its own, but also that's leaving out things like statues and common household items and the decorations like you're talking about. What what was 
most striking to you or what was washing over you as you were first there and taking all that in? So again, having come at this period from like, I'm, <laughs> I'm really grateful actually. Uh, cause I, I wanted to go to Pompeii for so long. Like my parents went like 20 years ago or something. And I always, and oh, I thought just how, how awesome that was. And, um, <laughs> But I'm, I'm incredibly glad I was never able to go until now, to be honest, because, um, you know, I was like going to get a guidebook to the city, but then like I didn't and just for complicated reasons, I wasn't able to get one. And then I realized like, you know, I don't actually need one because like I'm not an expert in this time period, but like I do know enough about it, at least as much about it as the guidebook would tell me. And like, I just, what I really want to do is like, I have spent a long time reading people talking about this culture and i would really like i i've done like my i've literally done my homework um like plenty of the younger i didn't go out and play in the <laughs> evening i stayed home and then didn't get killed in the in, in the in the in the volcanic explosion um and so i just want to see it you know just like enter into it and see what it is so like one thing that really so that was just a person like a really powerful experience was like in a certain kind of way being able to allow these things that i've dwelled on for a long time intellectually kind of let see what they look like see what to what extent they unfold before me see to what extent this experience is different etc you know um so one thing that's really neat so for instance this period the second sophistic um uh it's one of the things that marks it is that this is the big period where um, the Romans suddenly become super duper, 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 duper interested in um, Greek stuff, specifically Greek myths. I mean, everything to do with Greek stuff, but specifically Greek myths. Um, and it's really a big deal because um, before that, like kind of right before this period, um, it, it was fashionable to like hate the Greeks and hate Greek stuff and be like, ugh gross you know we're not gonna do it <laughs> um but from like the mid first century on for the next 150 years or so um it's like really all the all the rage all the vogue to like do greek stuff and like have greek myths everywhere and so like rich people one of the ways that you show off that you are rich is that you have had a really 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 expensive education so that's an interesting idea this is also a little bit new um is that a sign of wealth is a sign is that you've been able to get this very particular kind of greek education um which is very expansive it's not just that you know the language greek or that you can like read homer it's that you can like you have studied like astronomy and like grammar and uh literature and natural science and natural history and all kinds of things you know so it's a whole educational system um and one of the ways in which you signify uh to the people who come over to your house so one thing houses in this period are really 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 big deal they're they're very public spaces actually and they're meant to be kind of performances in a certain sense mm. um very yeah so um think a trump home only with <laughs> class now i realize i just told you to think about having air but having no air at the same time but in any case think about it think about a trombone but kind of like with class um so mor lago but the toilets are made of real gold real real gold yes exactly yes yes exactly yeah, yeah. um yeah exactly right um and um i uh, so you when you have people over for dinner and Romans would have this re these really, 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 really lavish dinners that would last like kind of all night, the most elaborate ones, um, uh, they would um, – so when you invite your friends over for this like – or maybe your enemies, who knows, um, for this big fancy dinner party, um, you want to show like – how smart you are, how well educated you are, how fancy you are, um, and how rich you are. And the way that you do all of that is that you cover every, every single object on God's green earth in images of Greek mythology. That's what you do. It, it, this is, this were, is, were certain ones more popular or was it just sort of generally like, well, if it's Greek, it's good for me and I don't really care what it's of. There are certainly ones that are, that are more popular, but like, but to some extent, you could be like, boy, that just seems like some random. 
<laughs> it just seems kind of rando, bro. Be like, well, yeah, I know, but I mean, like, you know, you've got, like, I know, I mean, everybody knows about, like, Jason, but what about, like, you know, his younger cousin? It's like, okay, yeah, bro, <laughs> like, your your Greek teacher sucked, and you've got bad taste. So, like, I mean, of course, obviously, that happens. That's just life. But, like, um, right. I, but yeah, but they're, they're, they're definitely seeing things that are more common, but like, it's amazing. Cause you just see now one thing that's interesting about, about Pompeii is that like, um, it was, it was considered good archeological practice in the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. Um, that when you found something really, when you dug something up and you thought, found that it was really great. Um, what you do is that you scrape it off the wall or you tear it out of where it is and you put it in a museum um right. and that was considered it belongs good. in a museum this belongs in a museum exactly right so that was considered good archaeological practice so a lot of like the frescoes and physical objects and stuff from from pompeii are actually in a museum in naples which i was also able to go to which is really great um so there's that um but but even so like you go into this like villa you know and it's got pretty high walls actually and everything is everything is covered in this like vivid vivid red um kind of like a not a maroon what's the word i'm looking for um anyway this this kind of vivid red um, sort of a crimson almost kind of a crimsony yeah um uh and it covered in these beautiful paintings so like there's this one uh, very famous place is the House of Meander, I think it's called. Um, and uh, uh, it has all these amazing paintings, uh, these frescoes of of all of these incredible. Um, uh, and and this is a, this was a house from somebody who was actually very well educated, and so uh, not just putting putting on the performance. And so it's all like really stunningly done, and like the frescoes really work well together. Um, and there's something kind of amazing about realizing like. Yes, I mean this is a uh, this is participating in this whole cultural movement where your house is kind of like a, intentionally kind of made like a museum, and by that I mean like it's really intended that people will come and look at it, and that they'll come and they'll sure, think, yeah. think certain things about you and everything, and that's all cultivated right, and that's structured, yeah. and it's it's a surprisingly public place actually, and that's again by design. Um, don't think anything like a nuclear family. That's not what we're talking about, but um, but still, it's a residence, and it's your probably your only residence. I mean, some people might have had residences outside of town but it's basically your only resident for most people be your only 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 residence um and like this is how you live you know there's um there's just this this incredible this incredible sense of sort of physical splendor um uh like physical splendor and permanence as well like not just because it's from 79 ad because of historical chance but like um when you decorate your house like this you can't ever change it you know, I mean, to change it oh, requires sure. changing yeah. the entire house, right? Because the right, entire yeah. thing is the same stunningly beautiful kind of crimson color. Um, all of the frescoes go together. The only way that you can redo a fresco, you know, I mean, it's the wall. So you tear down the wall or you make your room smaller by putting more on top. Um, so uh, not something you do lightly. Um so right away, there's this cultural value difference that I think is really important to note where art isn't meant to be ephemeral. Um, things are being built here with the intention that like, this is a static environment. This is, this is sticking around, um, which is, you know, a fundamentally different attitude that most of us have towards art. Like even, even those of us who care enough, as we've talked about in many, many different episodes to, to, to do, you know, to, um, to go out and buy, art from a local artist to hang on our wall. We're still just hanging on our wall. We can right. replace it if we want to, or if the aesthetic of the room changes or if the purpose of the room changes and we want to paint over everything, we can, we can put that art someplace else. And this is a fundamentally different attitude towards the, the point of beauty and, and our attitude towards it and what it's for and how long it's supposed to be there, which I, I think is right off the bat, really worth kind of sitting with. It totally is, you know, and, and some of it, including ways in some ways that seem very contingent and you think and you kind of ask yourself like bro what were you kind of thinking though so like for instance this is very famous you you probably have seen images of it um uh in the entryway to um a building 
in uh what's it called the house of the philosopher i think they call it but it doesn't matter anyway um at the entryway to a to a building um slightly out of the central part of the city um is this big actually quite lovely mosaic um i of a dog on the ground this is on the ground right um it's of a, mm-hmm. of, a of a big angry looking dog and it says kawe kanem beware of dog <laughs> <laughs> and you just think like bro that is a mother loving mosaic which is this is a hyper that is more permanent than you are yeah and I've, certainly more permanent than the particular dog it's describing is well this is the point you know i mean this is no okay this is of course this is a slave culture like this is i mean I although artisans wouldn't necessarily have been slaves I'm not sure actually how many artisans would have been slaves um I, I confess my ignorance on that point but like um I you know anyway so they're, they're, it, this is not a time where we'd be like well you know we just need to like make sure that everyone's getting uh what he's due and then like everyone will be happy at the end of the day and we just all you know a rising tide raises all ships like this is not that this is not this is not that culture you know like yeah. it's I get mine you get stabbed maybe and like that's life you know or maybe like my maybe my maybe my conus just like bites the hell out of you and like that you didn't you didn't cobble my con so there it is um uh but even so yeah yeah you made a pretty big mosaic you know like you know your dog is gonna live a maximum of 20 years right it's a strong choice it's a it's strong strong, choice. strong I, choice you can make sure that you that you get like that you raise another nasty dog? I mean, I guess the answer is yes. Okay, this is like, I don't know. I, I feel yeah, like you this sort is, of have to keep you. It's it's like a it's a self fulfilling prophecy in a certain way. Where you're like, we gotta just keep buying dogs that look exactly the same, man. Because yeah, we no, gotta exactly. make this thing make sense retroactively. It's gotta be. I, I think. I mean, it's kind of like getting a face tattoo. You know, like if you once you've once you've gotten that thing arching over your eye, like, well, you're just gonna always have to have a pit bull, and that's just. <laughs> you know you committed to it this is just part of you now yeah this is who you are um speaking of speaking of speaking of commitments that happen to you once you get a tattoo over your eye i want to give a shout out to our sponsors um <laughs> because that was the worst transition i've ever heard uh, you should be ashamed of yourself you loved it and I love it. And um, that's just how it is. This is how we're going to do all of our translation transitions from I, now on. You're confusing, you're confusing my love for you with my love for it. But anyway, carry, carry No, on. that's not true. In any thing. case, well, here's, here's, here's why I tell you. Here's why I tell you. But I want to tell you, you personally, Jacob Flores Popchick, I don't, everybody else turn this off. What I'm going to tell you is that Creative Things is brought to you by Catholic Creatives. Um, and you oh, say, what is that? I know, what is that? I say, well, it's an organization. Um, there are lots of kinds of organizations, but this is the kind that's dedicated to igniting a new renaissance of faith through prayer, beauty, and the creative spirit. Um, and they do so by connecting and supporting artists and innovators and storytellers and stuff um, all across the faith. Um, but it takes, you know, a community to bring big ideas like that to life. So, um, um, you, Jacob Flores Popcheck, you should support Catholic Creatives on Patreon. I should. You should. I should do this. You oh should do God. this. Yeah. Maybe if you okay. see, I think if you start, then everybody else will get excited. Um, and uh, that makes and, sense. I am an influencer. I'm you're a as an inf- as an as an influencer. Um, uh, follow us on Instagram. Uh, you know, you will know um, that if you support us on Catholic Creatives on Patreon, uh, then you contribute to like workshops summits resources outreach is meant to support um catholic artists all over the world um so check it out it's catholiccreatives.org slash support um and once you have um been influenced by jacob the influencer uh thor's pop check then you can go to catholic uh catholic.store that's a thing we use words now at the end of (laughs) <laughs> web addresses it's like when you used to say www dot now we say catholic dot store there it is it's um, crazy it's crazy how the anyway, world go there how they sell change. stuff that's where it is man so um yeah go buy stuff buy stuff do it okay um back to artists who were maybe slaves creating uh mosaic dogs 
Yeah. So, so some of these things, like the the perception of permanency, like is so intense that sometimes like it 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 can be hard to understand. You know, I mean, and I would say vice versa for us. Like, there's a certain sense of like, wow, we're so committed to like movability and impermanence that like it can be hard to understand. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, well, or like, um, um. What is one reason why no, why almost nobody would ever have a fresco in his house? Like, uh, well, because you could never resell that house. You right. know, but you these people are not planning to ever sell that house. That is not the um, intention, right? You know, um, so even even though, like, I mean, frankly, uh, I I have a good friend who the house he grew up in is covered in frescoes. Um, it's a long story. Um, and <laughs> it's in fact really sounds, glorious. It's really glorious. Like it could, that could be that long story could be an episode all its own. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt it could be. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's like super, it's super glorious actually. Um, and it gives you a whole different perspective on art. And when it's not something that's just like movable, changeable, like, as you say, I don't like it there, there literally isn't a frame, you know? So it's, it's, um, it's, 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 um, I mean, there is literally not, nothing separating you from it. It's just the wall. It's the context in which you live. There it is, you know. Um, again, including when it seems like kind of weird. So like um, when Romans, when a when a Roman, I mean here Roman culture, not, not somebody from the city of Rome, um, is going to get his dinner on, this is what you do. Um, you go to your triclinium, um, We've all oh, got right. Everyone has one of those. Everyone's everyone's got one of those. Um, well, you better because otherwise you're not going to eat. Um, <laughs> so you go to your triclinium, uh, which I uh, so it three. It means three things to recline on. Um, it's like a dining room and it's like shaped like a U um, where you have sort of like three tables in front of you and then they 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 would recline at table right um like like we'll be familiar with from the gospels um and so you have like three three tables with you know um places to recline um set up in a u uh that's your triclinium and you go and you just hang out with your buds and you like drink insane quantities and you eat insane quantities of food that's sometimes really good and sometimes seems really 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 gross um and you just do that um until we you go to the place where you barf and then you come back um and you keep doing it so etc um so there's one of these houses in pompeii that has you know there's a ton of triclinia there which is really exciting and um uh one of these triclinia uh has this like so one of the vogues at the time was um egyptian stuff so egypt was relatively recently um conquered by the roman empire and so like egyptian things are like really uh fashionable they're just in vogue uh sure yeah yeah so the the real vogue like the serious i'm a big boy vogue is for greek stuff but as but also egyptian stuff is a big vogue um but in a more sort of 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 like a pop like a pop kind of a way yeah yeah, yeah. Even if yeah. it'll be used by the same people. So there's this one triclinium that's like kind of small, but um, I mean, I'm small, so it's big enough for me. And um, <laughs> I was one thing I got to say, like everything in Pompeii is right, right sized, right sized. That's so sad to hear. All these assholes. So sad to hear. All these asshole tour guides um, in like French, German, <laughs> French, German, and English are like, I. Uh, yeah, everybody in the past was so small. That is why the <laughs> walls are so low. Everyone was so small. Ha, 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 ha. And I was like, F you. I feel at home here. In fact, I have a photograph of me standing and feeling at home in a very, very, very low door, which we'll put up uh, on the episode here. Um, oh. And um, I did actually see recently, I think, I think it was on Zillow. There was some Irish castle for sale. And the guy was talking about in the video, he was like, yeah, pretty much only Americans buy these because no actual European person would ever do this because they know what would go into the upkeep. But he said one of the big hurdles that does stop people from buying it, even Americans, is that and he walked over to where they had like the restored bathroom because they had a bathroom in here. But the the door was only about four and a half feet tall. 
And so you have to sort of crouch down to go into the room and then stand up and go to the bathroom. And he was like, most people are just not willing ultimately to make the commitment to just constantly bending down to enter any new room. Um, and, uh, and so these things are hard to sell actually. It turns out <laughs> turns castles out. are actually cheaper than you'd think they are. Cause they're just so bloody and convenient, but, uh, yeah, but I guess not for you, I guess yeah, if we cheaper can make up you... front, but, uh, but much more expensive long run. Um, but except right, unless, yeah. unless you are decently sized, at which point, um, everything right. is, everything is sort of built for you. It's fantastic. Um, Perfect. yeah. And so in this, this trick, the walls of this triclinium, there's this like random, um, they're really into painting what they think are pygmies. So basically just like people with very small bodies and really big heads and usually really big butts. I cannot lie. Okay. You, Not you other problematic. Can't deny. Not problematic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. Yeah. Just, Yeah um hard to know i mean they were intent. they were making fun i mean it was they were not they were not meant to be respectable and they're not respectful um uh but yeah so these like pygmies sort of like um chasing hunting or being eaten by crocodiles for instance because that's how you know it's taking place in egypt because there's crocodiles you know oh so sure yeah, yeah, these, yeah. <laughs> these kinds of hilarious things you're just like wow they, this guy basically made a comic strip of like pygmies trying to hunt trying to kill but in fact being eaten by a crocodile and he just like made that a permanent feature of his dining room wall like this this is my whole personality yeah like wow <laughs> you are just be forever <laughs> exactly it's like i mean this joke you will and your, never not you, be funny yeah you and your friend kave Kanem, you know it just think like you guys Maybe you know what's coming is the point. Maybe secretly, yeah, you, like, you know what's yeah, coming and you know you're, you're only going to enjoy psychic. this for a couple more years. <laughs> yeah, you're either psychic or you just really know how to commit to a bit. Like yeah, hardcore. super committing. Super committing. Um, okay, so there's, there's, this, is, this about permanence is really something very dramatic. Um, I do want to give a call out, though, a call back to one of our previous episodes. Um, which is the one on graffiti. Oh, sure. Because, yeah. Um, imagine my surprise when I was in the um archaeological museum, which is in Naples, like I said, that which has a lot of the frescoes and things which they removed and put into the museum. Um imagine my surprise when I'm looking at this image of um it's like Isis Fortuna. Demeter, this is this is the way that this is the way this stuff works. So like Isis is the is the Egyptian god, Fortuna is the um Roman Latin god, and then Demeter is the Greek god, and it's one figure who is representing all, all three of them because they've been kind of joined together. Okay. So so she's here, she's holding a a rudder. Cause why not? Kind of an mm-hmm. oar. She's kind of holding an oar because, like, yeah, one cool. of them things. Chicks, chicks hold oars. It's cool. They do it. Some kind um, of aquatic stick, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Like I respect that, you know. And um, and a cornucopia in the other hand, which is cool. It's chicks mm-hmm. dig cornucopias. It's cool. And then it looks like to her left. I mean, to looking when we look at the painting to the left, uh, it there's this like what looks kind of like a naked boy crouching down. And being like bitten on the head, on either side of the head by two giant snakes. Ooh. And you think, what the heck is up with that? Um, but if you've been wandering through Pompeii by that point, you'll realize that like um, part of this like very lavish world that they're living in is like um, everything is also like abundantly full of gods especially household gods like this is a big thing in roman culture is, is like at the entryway um you have different places for the the lares the panates these household gods um that you when you're entering the house or leaving the house that you'll you'll do these um acts of reverence to um and i uh, i and so like one of the common ways that that these um household god Re- acts of reverence are, are signified um in frescoes in pompeii is that uh is these big snakes who will often be like eat a uh, so a snake one on either side a pair of snakes on either side often going towards a um 
like a food offering that you've offered to them. They're they're fundamentally they're good luck snakes. Like they're not bad snakes. They're good luck snakes. Um, I uh, and so like so they're not actually a signifier of something evil, even though they seem like they would be. But um, in this sort of I mean, maybe they are as well. But here they're being signified as something that's like bringing good fortune. Yeah, um, a net positive, whatever their will is. Right, exactly. And um and then the like the little naked boy is um again Greek I sorry, um uh Egyp- Egyptian uh, Egyptian Horus Greek Harpocrates Latin Dionysius. Um sorry, it's always that's that's a trilogy I have a hard time remembering, but they're all this same um uh so there's this naked child god horus the the, the, the rights relatively small this is a, a thing that that the uh latins then pick up from egypt is that um he's a child so like horus is a child god um so uh oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah yeah so it's basically dionysius a, ch- a child dionysius um like welcoming um these like good luck snakes um or receiving these good luck snakes so in the end this is actually a lot of like a lot of really positive imagery like you look at it and to us it looks like oh so this chica is like watching a child be like eaten by snakes but no it's like here's a here's a good luck um here's a good luck uh goddess and then like uh a a god of like fertility and youth and stuff and then like he's receiving like these blessings from these snakes uh and they might be taking up some stuff from horus about like um immunity from like snake bites and stuff like that um for the people who look at it and pray right symbolism upon symbolism crashing into other symbolism and looking weird from the outside but in the inside having a completely consistent sort of visual language iconographical language that that makes sense to those people and why am I dwelling on this? Because scrawled on top of it in the negative space above the snakes is Kakator Kawe Malum Theater Beware of Evil. What? <laughs> yes. This was this was uh, in our in our graffiti episode. This is one of my favorite graffitis, um, which is represented twice actually in surviving um uh two different versions in surviving Pompe- Pompeii graffiti, but this is one of them. Uh is that because again, like public so ladies and gentlemen, when you live in very small spaces, and uh there's one contemporary sociologist who makes the argument that um life in a city at this time period was actually more crowded than contemporary Bombay. Um Oh, it's wow. it's an argument it's an argument but uh, it's it it gives you a sense of scale um so you're living all, all on top of each other and they had a pretty they had a much better sense of hygiene than um many places elsewhere before during and after um but you're still living pretty much on top of each other and um they're you know and and so like people pooping in public it's going to be a thing. And so now what if you have this like nice fresco, this like good luck fresco for like the gods that you're pretty into. Um, and then like some bunghole keeps just like, <laughs> or a lot of bungholes actually keep like pooping on the ground in front of it. And like, this is you're this is supposed to be your like good luck thing. And like these people are leaving presents, but these are not the presents that you were looking for. Um, and so like somebody just scrawls on it shitter beware of evil there it is yeah so this is uh, also just, a consequence i'm not going to necessarily describe what the evil is but just it's a vague amorphous evil and it's definitely going to happen if you poop on my painting yeah exactly exactly right so um yeah no it's totally amazing so um but i want to uh but at the same time like um in all this sort of material world, like um, this sense of the sort of like lavishness and richness and abundance um, and the way that things come, uh, there is also, I mean, uh, if you've ever seen the the TV show Rome, um, which is not like super historically accurate, but it, but it does at least try to give you a sense visually and aesthetically about what it's like to live in this kind of culture, in this kind of a city, in this kind of a place where you get the sense of like things being kind of like too much and too much and too much and too much and too much. And like the way in which this whole world is made possible by the lives of slaves and these things is like literally inescapable. It's like physically built into the space and everything. Um, 
And like, and so there is something about it that can seem sort of like a little bit bleak, you know, in a certain way. And with it, I just want to like kind of close us on this sort of unexpected tableau, which is, um, I'm going to jump way forward in time. So there is a man named Bartolo Longo, um, who's from Naples in the mid 19th century. And he... Uh, he grows in this very tempestuous time period um, when it was very clear. Everyone believed that like um, Christianity was for like old ladies, idiots, and children, basically. And so he loses his faith in college. He he dabbles in sort of like um, magic, demon worship. He gets ordained like a spiritualist priest, which is kind of like a Satanist priest, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And he performs a kind of the like, first time he he's leading a kind of spiritualist satanic ritual um which works with the dead um he has this like incredibly horrifying vision of his dead father um and like realize and but he but he's like suck suck in this pit and like he nearly has a nervous breakdown uh nearly dies and nearly kills himself everything's insane he's still a spiritual spiritualist satanic priest like he doesn't know what's happening in his life um he ends up meeting a Dominican, actually, um, returning to the faith, making his conversion, you know, making his confession, gets super into the rosary for complicated reasons, ends up going to the town, the new town of Pompeii that had grown up outside of the ruins and is like horrified by what he sees that um, the level of ignorance of the people and their faith, you know, like he first, he tries to like very gung ho, like preach the rosary to them. Um, but they like literally don't know enough to even be able to understand what the prayers mean. So like there's this famous story where he asks um, like a farmer, um, how many gods are there? And the gods and the farmer says, well, when I was a kid, there were three, but that was a long time ago. So I'm sure at least one of them has either died or gotten married. (laughs) An amazing sense that like if you were if you get married, you can't be God anymore. You know, this is amazing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, he like so this is whole he decides that he's going to he's going to stop doing multiple things at once and he's just going to commit his whole life to like living with these people and to try to understand like the gospel with them in this very like intimate way. Um and so he does and then like he starts rebuilding this kind of dilapidated church in town um and then some benefactor gives him this painting of Our Lady uh like Mary handing St. Dominic and St. Catherine, the rosary. And artistically speaking, it's a work of absolute garbage. Like he, he looks at it and he tries to refuse the gift because it's, it's, it's a dilapidated painting and it was always a bad painting. Like it's, it's not an (laughs) impressive work at all. Um, but he can't refuse it. And so he ends up getting the thing restored, but it remains a bad painting. It's just a bad painting. Um, he kind of puts it in the church that he's trying to rebuild. And then like, and then there start to be a bunch of miracles, And like a bunch of miraculous healings and cures and stuff from like people coming to pray in this space that he's built and like this painting, which is so ugly that he's placed into this church. And like, um, it ends up becoming this really big basilica. Um, he ends up giving his entire life founding these orphanages, um, that completely transform like the culture and the town and the city and the culture of um of pompeii and give it a a life like a real life um and there's all these miracles associated with this with this totally ugly nothing special painting that's set in this big basilica to our lady um and this amazing weird artistic spiritual Con, you know conversion kind of reality um which is like it's sort of, in a certain way it's everything the old pompeii is not you know it's mm-hmm. kind of like ugly it's not attractive it's there's no dignity to it it's like going away from like these kind of so to so to say like sexy paganism to kind of like boring christianity and even the art involved is actually specifically the major piece of art is actually specifically kind of ugly and yet like that's where god is that's where miracles happen and that's where people are healed and there's this wild thing about being in old pompeii is that many places in in old pompeii you can stand literally in the ruins 
of a beautiful and fallen culture and look up and see the dome and the spire of this bizarre, unexpected, unwanted house of miracles, which is the <laughs> the the Basilica of Lady of Our Lady of, the, of Pompeii in in the new city of Pompeii. And to me, it just perfectly is what, um, what it means to be a Christian. I think um, you could see that as like a clash of cultures, but I don't think we necessarily have to. You know, you could see it as a kind of like uh, dreary, ever present reality about oh, Christianity among this like lost glory of a former culture. Um. I don't think you have to see it that way. To me, standing in the in like the actual ruins and the beauty and the splendor and the horror sometimes of that of that culture that's been so long gone and its material remains, you could look up and see a sign of hope. And it's that's that really beautiful. Yeah. That's really beautiful. And and I even just the juxtaposition because we do, you know, to, uh, we we do talk so much about you know art that people think is beautiful versus art that people think is ugly or trashy or or even you know juxtaposing in this conversation you know the art that in in the time when uh, Vesuvius erupted that that there's you know the difference between the classy art and then sort of the more pop art and and just to think that you know, what we view as beautiful in a given moment, isn't necessarily um, the most sacred or the most actually beautiful thing, you know, that, that the things that were ugly for them survived alongside of the things that they thought were beautiful. And the thing that even this saint that you're talking about thought was ugly is, you know, rich with, miraculous grace or or a a a uh, a channel i guess i should say miraculous grace on some level and that that i think is important to think about as an artist because we can be so principled in striving for you know oh what's what's the you know, what's real beauty or what's real art or what's this or what's that and 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 realizing hey you know maybe maybe we've got the whole thing inverted is at least important to meditate on yeah no i think that's right you know so, listen, I just want to say, you know, think big, think long, think permanent, think Kawe Kanem, even, <laughs> even if you know your dog's going to die in five years. Um, even if your dog's already dead. It's even if your dog's already it dead, you can, you can get another one who's just as mean. And, um, you know, use what, use what you have. Use what God's given you. So I'd try to be open for it to be something that can last as a source of grace. So go forth and create cool things. You've been listening to Created Things, a podcast of Catholic creatives, hosted by Father Gabriel Toretta OP and Jacob Flores Popcheck, produced by Jessica Flores Popcheck and Kyle Meineke. To find out more about how you can support the podcast and other ventures for artists, visit catholiccreatives.org forward slash support.